Ace Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome back to Vaguely Accurate. Today is a very special episode as it is our second instalment to finish the conversation we started last week with Bronwyn Milkins. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Western Australia uh, studying cognitive psychology and she's also a strong mental health advocate. If you haven't heard the first episode, I strongly encourage you to check it out. The first episode was discussing her work and the field of psychology itself. This second episode, we will be looking into mental health discussing Bronwyn's experiences and to take it, looking at topics such as anorexia and body dysmorphia. If you have any opinions about the show, it would be great to get in contact with us and we'd love to hear what you have to say. But without delaying the show any further, let's get into it. Cheers, guys. And now I'd like to take a bit of a moving on yeah. towards you're a huge mental health advocate. Yes, I am. Yeah. You've got your own blog that you work yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, it doesn't have a name. It's just on my website though, which is Bronomilkins.com slash blog. Um, yes, yeah, so I write about mental health and I guess just life and all the things that I guess I've kind of encountered in my lived experiences of mental illness. So I try to make it as helpful as possible for other people. So if you don't mind me asking, yeah. what has motivated or instigated this strong interest in communicating mental health disorders yeah. and talking about your own experiences? And could you also tell us a bit about your own experience? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I I originally got into speaking about mental health, I guess, from my own condition, which started when I was 16. And it was in my first year of university, so I did finish high school when I was 16 and went straight on to university. How do people do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I skipped a grade when I was in primary school, and then, right. I, and then I moved states, and just the Australian school system works. So I was just 16 in year 12. Um, wow. Yeah, so uh, my first year of uni was really challenging. A lot of people find their first year of uni really challenging, and like many others, I struggled a bit, and that caused me to develop really severe anxiety and depression. Um, and I think just from a combination of my personality, I was quite perfectionistic when I was younger and I was quite hard on myself and quite negative about myself. And then I also just had this, I guess, internalization of the cultural idea for thinness and that it was definitely, if you're thin, you're successful. And that caused me to slip down into a path of an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't motivated by vanity or I wanted to look better, rather it was developed because I felt so awful about myself and I felt so disgusted at myself that I thought the only solution to fix that was to exercise as much as I could and then eat as little as possible because then people wouldn't have any reason to be disgusted at me because I'm doing the culturally acceptable thing of being thin. Um, Unfortunately, I guess driven by that self-loathing of myself, it had a lot of health consequences for me. So I lost weight quite rapidly. My hair started falling out. My skin started turning blue. My bones became very brittle. I had several medical scans and my hips had deteriorated to that of an 80-year-old and I was very close to osteoporosis. Um, my heart rate dropped to just 30 beats a minute. So yours should be beating happily at around 70 right now. And that put me at risk for sudden cardiac arrest and I was asked to go into hospital a number of times but it still didn't help me I was still like I need to do this I am so disgusting and I really at that point I was around 18 and I really just wanted my life to end because I didn't see that I had anything worthy to contribute and I thought I should just end And I really just wanted to kind of die by my illness. And I really just hoped that one day I would have a heart attack and that I would just die. And it sounds, it sounds awful, doesn't it? And it was, it was absolutely awful. Um, and nobody telling me that I was okay or, or that it was all good really helped me. I was so stuck in that mindset and I couldn't see any way out of it. Eventually I was hospitalized, um, for just over a month and best decision I've ever made my psychiatrist said I should go into hospital but ultimately he said it's up to you and I thought I I just can't do this by myself I as much as I wanted to be in control and 
I thought that I knew exactly what was happening and I knew I was absolutely obsessed with numbers as well. So I was like, if I exercise for 45 minutes, that burns X amount of calories and if I eat this amount of food, then this will be, you know, the amount. And I thought I had it all in control, but by the end of it, I just hated weighing myself. I hated looking at myself because it made me sad that I was continuing to lose weight and it made me feel awful if I was to gain weight. So I just... It sounded like the treatment worked. I suppose that's a complete turnaround on your original perspective of yourself. So I guess I'm quite fortunate because for a lot of people who have anorexia, which is what I was diagnosed with, um, they go into hospital maybe two, three times, Mm -hmm. even more. I was in hospital once and I was really determined to recover and it took several years of therapy group therapy, individual therapy, uh, lots of, I guess, determination and also the support of my friends and then partner and my family to actually get well and get to the place where yeah. I am now, which is... Healthy. Yeah, healthy. Yeah, yeah. I really like myself. Life is Mentally, good. Mentally, physically. Everything. Yeah, life's great. Yeah. Um, but it took a long time to get there and that's what motivated me to start speaking about it. I was like, because when I was 16, I had no idea what anxiety or depression was. I had no idea what it looked like in me. Um mm. I, I just thought it was normal. Um, I thought it was normal to feel this way, and it, it wasn't. Do you have photos you look back on, and you see yourself then, and you can see yourself now? Oh, definitely. Sleep? And, you know, I have memories where I just spent all summer by myself because I thought that I was too boring to hang out with other people <laughs> sort of thing. And it's like, it didn't have to be that way. And I really wanted to speak to other people to tell them that, like, you're not boring, you're fine as you are, you don't have to be thin, life is good sort of thing, and just educate them as well, Um, which is, you know, I've racked up around 30 grand of hex debts for my university degree, I might as well put it to good use and educate people. Exactly. Yeah. With um, anorexia, I know it's it's mental health in itself is often misunderstood and not quite um, understood by the public in itself. So it's always so great that you're a public speaker. Yeah. This could reach out to some people. Yeah, definitely. Educate them. Anorexia in itself, I know, is a particularly horrible... Yeah, it um, is. I suppose, condition, Mm. whereby... If I'm... Correct me if I'm wrong on this. It's something I've heard, but out of all mental health conditions, it has the highest mortality rate, including suicide across other disciplines where... The suicide may be attempted by other mental mm. health, but it's not often succeeded. Whereas yeah. anorexia, it, like you said, it, it causes your body to slowly shut down. And that is actually statistically the highest mortality rate. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah. So if not suicide, then your body will give up after yeah. a period of time. Yeah. Did you find um, that this perception of yourself mm. uh, was fueled by any anything in particular? Because you've said that your perception was skewed by what you thought society required of you where did this um view of what society required come from did you find it came from the traditional sources that people always talk about like social media and media sources or did you find it came from um i don't know yeah where did you find oh it's so difficult to say hey i've I guess a few years ago when i was doing individual therapy i did talk about it with therapists but i remember been weighed when I was in year three and then all the other girls were comparing their weights which is bizarre looking back year on it three. why would you weigh a year three like school girl it's just bizarre it was at, school. at school yeah at school that's weird it is weird isn't that's it that's really weird that's super weird <laughs> and I remember like at eight years old thinking that I took up too much space and I just you know I'd sit it down kind and of crept up on you yeah right? and um like I guess at um, and a risk factor for developing an eating disorder is developing mm-hmm. earlier. So like as a mm-hmm. girl, sort of like reaching maturity earlier. And so I did notice I was different. But, you know, nobody explicitly said to me, like, you're taking up too much space and you're ugly and you should be thinner sort of thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing what young people pick up earlier. And I guess that's another facet of psychology because young people do pick up on the subconscious things that you communicate to them, like through your body language or through your tone of voice it's not just what you say but how you say it and perhaps I picked up on some of that I was never keen on Barbies or you know girly kind of magazines when I was younger I'd much prefer to play with a Meccano set and (laughs) so much more creative (laughs) they are they were super fun I made really good helicopters um (laughs) why 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 is Lego meant to be for guys I have no idea um but so I never I never had people like that it was just it was almost like I kind of thought about it and I kind of think of anorexia now as kind of the manifestation of depression for girls in the 21st century. It's it's 
it's horrendously more commonplace these days Incredibly so. just to be dieting all the time and just to have a negative self-perception of yourself you have a more well, social pressure everywhere especially exactly. with the increase i say so not so much of a segue but i was looking yeah. into the science of social media recently yeah. and a lot of people using it as a media source as yeah. in a news outlet yeah people now see news articles on social media yeah. as pretty much their source of yeah. news yeah so anything that's skewed like oh yeah 101 ways to get fit and thin and all yeah. these kind of strongly focused uh articles yeah. on people's appearances yeah. which are all over the yeah. social media itself i can incredibly easily mm. bias this and i suppose it comes up to what you were talking about earlier with the cognitive ne- negative bias yes and i suppose this is what yeah. is fueling that negative bias you see friends you see other things all over the place yeah outside inside yeah and you just I suppose, like you said, it kind of almost crept up on you. Yeah, it did. Which is but, odd. I've never heard anyone describe it as that. Like, I, yeah, and it, it did very much. And I guess like a younger, like I, I think my first episode of depression was when I was ten years old, and that's when my family moved to Sydney, and I moved schools, and I, I went to about ten different schools when I was growing up. Um, my dad was in the navy, and you know, it was just a few risk factors combined. And when I started dieting, that's also a risk factor for an eating disorder. And about mm. one in 100 people who diet will continue to go on to develop an eating disorder. And I was that one in 100. So that's what, that's what happened. And I just, I feel so sorry for young people today. Anybody who, I just feel like social media is giving rise to just a culture of narcissism and wellness, mm. especially where wellness is associated with pureness and vitality and success and you see your golden star moments but no one ever sees exactly else, right? exactly and we're constantly bombarded by people's successes and achievements and i just i feel so i feel so bad i just feel like i when i do my mental health talks i do talk about that nobody wants to post a photo of themselves if they've just gone out of bed with ratty hair but everybody will want to post a photo of them being glamorous of the beach yes, and looking 100 percent. so yeah which is i i I, I need to double fact check this, yeah. but originally Facebook, I, th- I heard about the original manuscript or the instructions for yeah. Facebook, how mm. it should be used, and mm. it was never used as a platform to screw perce- skew perception, yeah. but it was used as, if you see something during the day that yeah. makes you smile, if you hear a oh. quote or hear or see, witness something, yeah. write about it, tell people wow. about it, take a photo of it, so it was more of a platform to share the highlights of your day. If, you've been, mm. if you're with family members that you haven't seen for a while, take a photo of that and share that wow. with your friends. That was what Facebook ha- itself yeah. identified as. And then over time, it's obviously evolved. It has, things. yeah. Um, and I don't know if you've seen it. Have you been watching Black Mirror? Oh, I love Black Mirror. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we're not going to spoil... No spoilers from this. I don't want anyone chunking out. I've but, only um, seen the first three episodes, though. Of season three or one? One. One, okay. okay. How weird is that David Cameron type? Oh, my goodness. Like, when I first saw that, I was like... Did you, I'm, I'm sure you obviously know, but like they had to, David Cameron at the time, after that episode came out, I won't spoil it, yeah. but what he did, yeah. he actually did in the UK, oh. in university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had to sign, the Black Mirror um, writers had to sign a declaration saying they had no prior knowledge of this Oh, before. really? Like we weren't doing it as a stigmatization. Wow. Thing. That was just something that emerged later oh, on. Oh, I didn't know that. that was, Kind of, it was not David Cameron in the show, yeah, but no. it was hinted at him. Yeah. Um, wow. There is. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but there yeah. is a talking about what we're talking about. There is a great, great episode. I think it's season three, episode okay. one. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's again, it goes on that whole social media, but mm. you see a rank. You know how like you can rate oh, people five gosh. stars. You see people. That'd be such a good plot. A rank like four point six, two point wow. three. Yeah. And like you know. The rest of the world or the rest of society mm. is going, you can only come in this bar, it's a classy bar, or an average bar if you're 3.5. It's totally exclusive, so 4.7s and above in wow. here. And people, so it's not about how successful and intelligent you are yeah. in life. Your success is based on your social perception, how yeah. nice you are, how um, genuine you are, or yeah. what people are looking for at that moment yeah. in time. And the people rate every interaction they oh, have. How interesting. If you bump into someone, no stars, and that knocks you down ranks. And wow. your life can go it's up and down by one bad day. Yeah. It was a really, really good episode. That's so cool. I've got to watch that. Yeah, we're getting up to season two now. I'm very excited. Yeah, season, the end of season two is um, questionable for me. I think it was okay. my most standout episode so far. Oh, the, yeah. The White Christmas? The Black oh, Christmas? I'm so excited. Um, very <laughs> ethically questionable. Uh, I, do, I just love... Like, if anybody doesn't know Black Mirror, it's kind of like science fiction, but with 
contemporary issues that we're dealing yeah. with right now. It's awesome. It's amazing. And yeah. it's just kind of pushed to a single extreme. Yeah, totally. On everything. Yeah. Um, um, but with, with my public speaking now, like just leaving off that kind of individualistic culture, I really – what was instrumental in my recovery was really focusing less on myself and focusing more on being part of my community and mm. really creating meaning in my life that way. And I realized that nobody really cares what I look like no. and I'm, I'm fine. No, but you, you are the center to your own story. Exactly. But at something like eight out of ten interactions, with, yeah. if you include everyone you interact with throughout the day, you walk past all that. Yeah. Eight out of ten, they won't even, you won't even be in their memory by the end of the day. No. It's... And the ones that you are, it, they are direct interactions, yeah. and that's more about what you said, not yeah. about the way you perceived it. Yeah. And even then, they, you might walk away from a situation thinking, oh, did I sound a bit off there? Did I sound like I offended them? Mm. Like, they, they might. I'm not saying, you know, you walk around being ass, but <laughs> they, depending, most of the time, if you're worrying so much of a small detail, it's insignificant yeah. to you. It's insignificant. To it them. is. It is. It. Most people will remember you being nice and friendly then say like a pimple on your face like yeah exactly people, people just don't pay attention like i said we've got heaps of things to pay attention to throughout our day um so i really try and focus on this kind of community and doing things that give you meaning and yeah making sure that you're happy with yourself but also in your relationships with other people because i think that's where a lot of our meaning is found in how we relate to other people and be generous and kind and all that yeah. kind of nice stuff. Just be a good human. Yeah, be a good human. <laughs> and yeah. don't worry too much. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, one thing I would like to bring attention yeah. to and also ask about you, yeah. considering we're uh, mentioning yeah. the mental health side of things, yeah. is something that's lesser known, it's increasingly now, mm. but is um, body dysmorphia. Yes, yes, is, definitely. That's more of a derivative, I suppose, of anorexia. Yeah. It's not going to the you're going to starve yourself thin yeah. that's clinically defined as anorexia, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It's um, got people outside. Yeah, it's, uh, next office, yeah. Uh, it's more... Um, it's, it's more associated than guys, if I'm correct. But yeah. it's like rather than your ideal as a female, like society's mm. perceptions is being thin and long, lavish hair and all yeah. that. For a guy, it's being strong, muscular, being having this physique yeah. that you people can look up to. Yeah. And body dysmorphia is in the respect of giving yourself a very strict diet or not yeah. being happy with your appearance. Yeah. And there are conditions, well, um, levels of it where people can't leave yeah. the house or they change their clothes a hundred times because maybe they haven't gone to the gym or yeah. maybe they had a piece of chocolate and they just yeah. feel bad and they're like oh that makes my pet muscle disappear I don't know but <laughs> yeah. it is a thing that yeah, totally. really impacts people's yeah. lives and, yeah uh, yeah. Do you have any advice or anything to say on that? Yeah, so eating disorders are increasingly becoming common in males as well. And I think that is partly due to all the risk factors, I guess, associated with eating disorders in women, as well as the internalization of what a male physique should appear like. Mm. And it should be big and bulky and signify strength, like you say. And I think, so body dysmorphia as well, some people might just believe that their nose for example looks awful or is too big and you can show them that it's fine it's within it's on a bell curve it, it's fine but they'll go forward with plastic surgery and a number of plastic surgeries which harms them because they had a reasonable nose in the first place and then it might harm them financially as well because they didn't need to spend the money on their nose and they could spend it on other things um so body dysmorphia does have real consequences and it's something that i experienced a lot so when you mentioned changing clothes hundreds of times, me. When you mentioned not leaving the house because of your appearance, me. Mm. Um, I did that when I was 15, 16. And I refused to leave the house outside of school hours because I thought that no, my appearance was so ugly that people would be repulsed by me. Which just seems bizarre right now, but it's truly what I believed, which is just a horrible thing for a 16-year-old to think. Um, so... Body dysmorphia does have real consequences. It's not the kind of stereotypical thing that people think of when they think of anorexia, like they look in the mirror and they see somebody who's like 50 kilos heavier. Um, for me, it was as I got thinner and I got to quite a low, under underweight on the BMI sort of thing, and I would just see the fat that remained and I'd be like, that's what's left and that's what there is and that's what I am. So that's what it was for my personal experience, but everybody else might have a different personal experience. But it's always just focusing what was wrong with you and you can never get it out of your head. Um, and other people, they tell you you look fine, but you'd be like, you don't see what I see. And that would be the fact that you could continue to see. 
So for people who have body dysmorphia, I'd actually recommend seeking professional help for that because it can be quite debilitating. And like I say, if you even if you have a trusted partner, even if you have your mum tell you you look fine, you still got that mindset that you don't. And no amount of convincing can change this what is a delusion, which is a fixed mm. false belief. And you're out of touch with reality when you having these thoughts because you do look fine. So I'd actually recommend seeking professional help and talking to your doctor about it and then seeking help from a psychologist or another trusted health professional to help you look at these thoughts and see whether they match up with reality or consider alternatives or live with them if you don't want to change them. So it's not about getting you into therapy and saying force, forcing a belief down your throat. Mm. It's about let's, let's look, let's, let's look. examine. Yeah. yeah. And on that, when you mentioned, you know, you'll get your parents or your loved ones, yeah. saying, you look fine. Yeah. To you, that's, I suppose, it can come across as, yeah, that's a biased opinion. Yeah, I don't care. Exactly. Like, you've got to say that. Exactly. Before. Yeah, you love me. Of course, you're going to say, you yeah. love me. Yeah, I get that. Like, that's not in question. Yeah. Like, yeah. Course, you, you can boost my confidence. I'm not going to believe you, but yeah. good effort for trying. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's very complicated. And I have, um, I spoke once at Curtin University about body bodies, and there was, a professional from the gym who was also talking about body dysmorphia in males and he said that he sees guys at the gym who who will be there for hours each day who won't leave because they just think that they need to do this mm. and I empathize with them because he said to me that guys will ruin their relationships with their partners because they're so obsessed with going to the gym and doing what they believe to be attractive yeah. and is at the expense of other areas of their life. So I guess you can recognize if it is a problem for you, if it's affecting other areas of your life, like study, like work, like relationships, mm. and it's causing you to think negatively about yourself for a few days a week for most weeks. Um, if yeah. it's debilitating to your yeah. way of life, then it it's a problem. Be, it, it's a problem. Yeah. It's an issue that yeah. needs to be resolved before. It, can, it might yeah. not get any worse, but it can yeah. potentially get out of hand one day yeah. or one day could force you to do or be in a situation where it makes you go worse yeah. and a downward yeah. spiral. Not yeah. really it will go bad, but no. it could... Yeah, and honestly, like, as a person who suffered from severe body dysmorphia, not having those negative distortions about myself, like, I'm not saying I'm head over heels in love with every single part of my body. I still am like, ah, oh, you know, that could be a <laughs> bit firmer or whatever, but it doesn't, it doesn't rule my life and I'm much happier and I can do all the exercise that I really enjoy happily mm. and you know in in an appropriate time frame that doesn't impede on other things in my life yeah. so life is better life is better yeah we usually try and finish each episode with uh like a, a take-home note or yeah. anything you want to advocate for is there anything you would like to summarize up or say because there's been a lot of good advice yeah. throughout the end of the episode so. um yeah i guess like um on the research front um psychological research is a wide and varied field and there's lots of interesting things and it has made a huge impact on the world and i hope if you're interested you can find a few more psychologists or experiments have a google of what you're interested in whether that's cognitive psychology or social or vision and perception or memory anything else have a read about it and see what fascinates you with the mental health side of things a lot of things that i say in my talks The main message that I give it is that it's not weak to speak about mental illness. A few people have this perception that mental illness is a weakness, but actually speaking up about what you're experiencing, and we all experience hardship in our life and we all experience grief and difficulties, speaking up about that and seeking help is actually an action that you can take to bring you closer in line with the life that you do want to lead. And it's an incredibly courageous and strong thing to do so it's not speak to it's not weak to speak up about mental illness and it's helping you take action thank you very much no worries great slogan right there Mm. it's not weak to speak it's not it's not weak to speak so thank you very much no worries and that was Bronwyn Milkins thank you very much everyone for joining us on the show if you have any questions or anything you wish to ask you should be able to contact her directly a Twitter handle and some de- contact details will be posted in the description to this episode. If you would like to start a discussion about this, contact us on Twitter. Or if you have any personal questions you wish to ask us, then you can get in contact at vaguecomments at gmail.com. As always, we love hearing from you. And if you would like to meet us or meet me, um, I'll be at the ResBaz event at Curtin University in Perth, uh, starting on the 30th of January, I believe. 
So I'll be having this little stall there and you can come up to me, talk to me, and we'll be doing some nice, interesting, fun things as related to the event. It's great to have you and check out our website, www.vaguelyaccurate.com. As always, this is an Ace Podcast episode, so check out them and the shows that they have. Cheers, guys.